This is Cashflow Ninja, episode 150, with Ken McElroy. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Now, here is your host, MC Laubscher. Hello everyone, MC Lobster here and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. Thank you so much for joining me on our 150th episode. It's been just a little over a year since we've launched and I just wanted to thank all of our listeners from all over the world for your support and traveling with us on this lifelong financial education journey. Thank you for your emails and social media interaction and spreading the word about our show to your family, your friends, and your network. Just a quick announcement. We have launched the Cashflow Ninja interactive smartphone apps in the Apple Store for iPhone users and for Android users in the Google Play App Store. Apple iPhone users can download the app at CashflowNinja.com forward slash Apple, and Android users can download the app at CashflowNinja.com forward slash Android. I'm honored to have on the 150th episode of the Cashflow Ninja, Ken McElroy. Ken is the epitome of the word entrepreneur. For over two decades, Ken has experienced massive success in the real estate world from investment analysis and property management to acquisitions and property development. With over $700 million investment dollars in real estate, Ken offers a unique perspective on how to get the biggest return on investments. Ken is the author of the best-selling books, The ABCs of Real Estate Investing, The Advanced Guide to Real Estate Investing, The ABCs of Property Management, and most recently, his book on entrepreneurship, The Sleeping Giant. As the real estate advisor to Robert Kiyosaki of the Rich Dad Company, Ken and Robert have co-authored several audio programs, including How to Increase the Income from Your Real Estate Investments, How to Get Your Banker to Say Yes, and how to find and keep good tenants. Ken is also a chapter contributor in the newly released The Real Book of Real Estate. A champion and advocate for entrepreneurs and real estate investors, Ken has spoken worldwide at top industry events. With media appearances on television and radio, Ken also hosts the Entrepreneur Magazine's real estate radio program, where he helps listeners navigate the financial and legal arenas of real estate. Never taking life for granted, Ken is active in the community and has been the chair two years in a row for the Autism Speaks Walk in Arizona. Ken has also served on advisory boards for Child Help and AZ Food Banks, where he conducted the largest food drive in the state of Arizona. Please share your feedback and thoughts with me on today's interview. You can let me know your thoughts on Twitter by tweeting me at MC Lobsher or by email at info at CashflowNinja.com. And please remember to join our mailing list by signing up at CashflowNinja.com or texting CashflowNinja, one word, all capitalized, to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. You can support the show by becoming a patron on Patreon for $10 a month. And when you become a patron, you get access to our private Facebook page and a Cashflow Ninja t-shirt. You can become a patron by visiting CashflowNinja.com forward slash support. Have you read Rich Dad Poor Dad? Are you interested in real estate investing and don't know where to start or to get the results you want? For valuable information to get you started, visit JoinOps Properties at JoinOpsProperties.com. If you're not earning at least 8% on your cash, you do not want to miss the private lending presentation for non-accredited investors done by Jimmy Freeland and Bob Scott. Discover how to create an income stream from real estate without the management headaches. You can access the presentation at CashflowNinja.com forward slash private lending. Spartan Invest have a proven plan and system helping investors creating passive income and wealth through turnkey real estate ownership in the exciting market of Birmingham, Alabama. Find out why Birmingham has got it going on, why it's a steal right now, why it's a millennial hangout, a hidden gem, 
and one of the most exciting investment opportunities you have never heard of. You can download your free report, Five Big Reasons to Invest in the Magical City of Birmingham, Alabama, at CashflowNinja.com forward slash Spartan. I've spoken about the most powerful system on the planet, on the show, the banking system. And my firm, Valhalla Wealth Financial, helps people reclaim the banking function within their own lives through leveraging the premium tools and strategies of the wealthy. If you're interested in reclaiming the banking function within your own life and the infinite banking concept, you can access a free webinar presentation at CashflowNinja.com forward slash be the bank. Ken, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. I really appreciate it, Michael. It's going to be a fun interview. <laughs> Can you please share a little bit about your background and your journey with my listeners? Yeah, well, like probably a lot of people, it's had some highs and, you know, many lows. And, and um, uh, you know, basically was not planning on getting into this business. I had an opportunity to manage a building in downtown Seattle where, where I was going to school. And, um, I did, and I realized, uh, at that moment that that's a business that I wanted to be in. So I started studying, got into real estate, got into my real estate license and started managing properties. So for the company that has, that was actually handling that building and, uh, that company is a huge company now, one of the largest in the United States, uh, based out of Seattle, Washington. And so for the first eight years of my career out of, right out of school, I was basically managing other people's properties and that, uh, that really gave me the mindset to, you know, cause what I was finding is that they, they were all really, really, uh, amazing people, you know, and, but they were just investors. So they were just normal people, you know, trying to, trying to put their money to work. And, and I had just gotten out of university with a business degree and I did, uh, uh, you know, that didn't, didn't resonate. I, I just, you know, they didn't pass that knowledge on in school, you know. So, uh, you know, so I decided I was going to start buying and uh, I started buying with a, you know, w literally with just a two bedroom, two bath. And then I started buying, uh, you know, larger properties and four plexes, eight plexes. And then, then I started buying, you know, larger properties, uh, uh, like 200 units and up uh, about 15 years ago and uh, never, never really looked back. So the only job I ever had was in property management. And then I've had multiple companies since then. Um, you know, we currently have about 350 employees and we manage all our own properties. We own about 10,000 units, uh, mostly in Texas, uh, Oklahoma and Arizona primarily. And, um, you know, we're a, we're a ground up construction too. So we're a general contractor. We build our own stuff. We keep it. And, um, you know, I, uh, well, I ran into Robert Kiyosaki along the way about, uh, gosh, 10 years ago, I guess. Yep. And he was, uh, you know, uh, a big advocate on, uh, cash flow and property management, which is exactly you know, what I had believed. And, and not, not a lot of people, give property managers a lot of credit for whatever reason. And it's a very, very hard job. But uh, Robert had in his book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and, and he happens to be in Phoenix. I happen to be in Phoenix. Uh, we got introduced and, um, you know, he said, Hey, you gotta, you know, take, you know, come to one of my events. And I said, you know, I have no idea what you do. And, uh, you know, he was uh, putting on these events and teaching and all that. And so I went, uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed uh, helping people uh, navigate through things, uh, mostly financial issues. And, um, you know, so then I just became one of his advisors. And, and now we travel all over the place. And obviously, we're best friends. And But, um, you know, I actually hadn't read the book um, until, um, you know, like a lot of people. And, and I was actually doing it. So uh, it was kind of neat that uh, I actually I did read the book, of course. Uh, but it's, um, I completely resonated with everything in it. Now I've passed it on to my, my kids. I make them read it. And, uh, you know, my kids have started their own businesses. And, and so, uh, it's been great. It's been great to travel with him. It's been great to be a rich dad advisor. And, um, and I also, you know, have a, a, a great, uh, uh, company as well. Can you start it small? You, invested in yourself and your financial education. You learned a lot. And as you mentioned, you had the property management experience. How did you get started to go from buying that first smaller deal to then moving and eventually buying that first multifamily uh, deal? Yeah. So I know everybody asks me that question. It's a really good one because everybody wants to do that. You know, they want to buy a house and then buy a big apartment project. Well, 
you, you know, you got to understand the mindset I was in, Mike. I was, I was managing properties, 150, 200 units, 300 units, 400 units, all up and down the Western United States. And so, you know, my first big property that I bought was 182 units. And I, you know, I, I had already been around that. I had been managing it. You know, I, I, I was t- talking to the lenders. I was, you know, I was basically handling all everything inside of their click on the rent side, on the ex- paying the expense side, negotiating with landscapers, you know, all those things. So I understood from the inside out the operations. And so, and I also understood on what I could pay and what I couldn't pay based on those operations. And, and, um, and so, you know, all value of every, a big uh, commercial building, office building, retail building. It's, it's all based on the net operating income. You know what, what that property actually produces. That's what the banks look at. That's what buyers look at. That's what sellers look at. So when, you know, so, and I had been doing that. So when I got the point, the only thing I didn't know how to do quite honestly was raise money, put together a business plan, but I understood the building. I, I believed in it. And uh, I still own that building. Actually, I've never sold it. You raised capital from outside investors, and you touched upon that. Um, where did you uh, start? What advice can you give to some of the listeners that uh, you know to raising capital? Obviously, sales is <laughs> is the number one thing. You got you have to find the right deal, and then be able to sell the deal and communicate that effectively. But can you talk a little bit about raising capital, uh, more about the structure of the deal, what was kind of sort of the split, um, and where you found investors for that deal? Sure. Yeah. So the first deal that that I found, uh, we were actually managing. So it was a really, you know, it was something that I already knew very, very well. It wasn't for sale. The owner, who was based out of New York City, a very large company called Glenwood. Uh, the owner was Mr. Leonard Litwin. He's on the Forbes list. And so I was dealing with uh, Leonard and his um, and his family on this particular property. So he owns over 10,000 units in Manhattan. And uh, this was one deal that he had out here in Arizona and he was looking to sell it. And so oddly enough, you know, he's such an honorable guy. We basically did it on a handshake. You know, we came up to a price verbally I, and, um, and so then I was scared to death, of course. I was like, okay, what do I do? Especially with Leonard Litwin, you know, cause he's, he's, they call him New, New York Lenny. So I was, um, so I was, uh, you know, I, the first thing I did, like, like everybody, you, you know, I went to my rich uncle, right? Everybody's got a, a rich uncle and, um, he uh, politely shut me down. And, um, but the, the, the experience of sitting across from him and what he learned, uh, was invaluable. And I just kept doing that, you know, and I just, my network just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until I found people that would say yes. And it's interesting. What I originally thought when I started to raise capital, which was false, was that I needed a whole bunch of money in the bank before I went out and bought it, just like I did on a home, you know, like if I'm going out and find a house, I, I, I thought I needed to have all that money in the bank, but I don't you know, on a, on a, on a big apartment deal. In fact, you don't even actually need on anything. You, you know, what I learned later, you, you know, what you need and what, what all investors are looking for, Michael, as you, as you know, they're, they're looking for a return. So if you can show them on paper that, Hey, this is a great property in a great market. And here's all the work I did to, uh, and not the broker package. Cause you know, that's not going to, that's not going to be accurate. So, right. uh, you know, all the due diligence and stuff, I I'm telling you the deals sell themselves. We don't really, I, I can't remember one hard sell ever. You know, once you have all the information and you really know it and you really understand it and you have the right team in place, it's literally not that hard to raise capital. It's only hard if you don't have a network of people that can see it, but that's a different issue. You know, it, there's not a lot of selling behind it. They want to know questions. You, how'd you come up with this? How'd you come up with that? Especially the more sophisticated ones. But, you know, but I know the, pro- I knew the property operationally and, um, you know, so I had to sell it to the bank. I had to sell it to the investors and, um, y- you know, it, uh, uh, it was, it took, took, took a while. I mean, it took me over a month to raise the capital, but you know, I had uh, something like 90 days to put the whole deal together. So, um, you know, it worked out. I still own that property today and I'm excited about it. I'll never sell that. So you're looking for deals out there and then people approach you with deals as well. 
what are you, what are you looking for in deals right now? Is there a checklist that you can share that you draw some of your decision making from and quickly analyze properties? Sure. Well, I have all those checklists. Uh, probably the best way to get them is in my book, The ABCs of Real Estate Investing or The Advanced Guide to Real Estate Investing. There's checklists in there for that. There's checklists in the the, the uh, ABCs of Property Management also. There's checklists in there. There's, um, y- you know, honestly, what we do is we actually take a big macro view first. So the first thing that I do is I look at a market. And, you know, I want to find out whether or not that market has people moving in or moving out or it's, whether it's flat. And it's actually not too hard to figure that out. You know, every town is going one direction or another. And um, so, you know, things that can, things that can bring mark, you know, people into market might be low cost housing. It might be a big new employer, could be a military base, you know, it could be anything. You know, and and uh, for Arizona and Florida right now, which are the two largest or uh, the two states that are that are leading the growth, you know, it's it's all the retirees, you know, are moving there, and you know that's never going to change, you know. And in Texas, uh, they were really pro business back ten years ago, and so a lot of there's a lot of entrepreneur startups down there, and and healthcare is you know growing up down there. So you know, there's a you just got to follow those trends. So that's the first thing. That's a real high level macro view. And then from there, once we say, okay, okay, we like Texas, then you start drilling down to the cities, you know, and um, we started in Dallas um, and, you know, then we found like anything, you know, even where you're from, you know, New- in Newtown, there's, you know, there's good areas, there's bad areas. And, and, and so there's, there's a lot of local knowledge in real estate and you got to pay attention to that. So we decided that we were just going to buy basically north of Dallas in this triangle shape based on all the research we had done. And, you know, this can take months, but it's, you know, it's worth it if you're going to go heavy on investing down there. So we ended up buying in the Frisco, Carrollton, Richardson, Plano areas, all there's, these are all towns North of Dallas. And that's when we first got our footprint in Texas. And then from there, you know, there's even good and bad areas, you know, there's good and bad areas of, of Richardson and there's good and bad areas of Plano. And so, you, you know, so you gotta, you gotta meet with all the people that are local there and you gotta figure it out. And then once you're really, really, uh, you, you've crossed all your, um, T's and dotted all your I's on, on the markets, then you start looking for the real estate deals. And, you know, because you, what, what, what I, uh, you know, what you want it, you, you want is you want a market that's on the upswing and for whatever reason it's on the upswing. And, so that that can solve a lot of problems. Even you can even buy incorrectly, and a market on the upstream will save you. So the market is really really important. Then the next piece is that you dig into the project itself, you know, and um, you know they always you always hear the words location, location, location. Well, that's really really important. But really, you know, apartments are they're not that exciting you know they're they're on a corner you know there's either too many in an area or not enough and occupancies are high or they're not and you know so you got to dig into all those kinds of things and um, what we were looking for at the time was we were looking for value add communities so we were looking for stuff that you know we could add value so stuff that was maybe 80s or 90s that needed um, you know uh they needed improvements on inside the clubhouses and the paint the buildings and put new roofs on. And, and then we did a bunch of work on the insides as well. So stuff that we could get, say 75 to $150 a month in rent growth. And so that's what we were looking for. We were, you know, when we first started out, we were looking for value add. And, um, so that's, that's, um, you know, that's primarily what we do. And, and, and when we're looking at a new market, can I just want to reiterate the books, the ABCs of real estate investing, the secrets of finding hidden profits. Most investors miss the ABCs of property management, what you need to know to maximize your money now. And also the advanced guide to real estate investing, how to identify the hottest markets and secure the best deals. I would put that at the top of your list. If you're interested in investing in real estate, uh, that is a master's master's degree right there. Just in those books, fantastic resources. 
Can you mention adding value to the property? And that is one of the things following you and studying what you guys do that I find extremely interesting. You've touched upon that. Can you share a couple of other examples of how you guys added value to the properties that you guys purchased? Sure, sure. And by the way, all my book proceeds go to charity. So all my speaking books, all the stuff that I do, all rolls into our foundation and gets donated. I'll tell you a really, really easy one that um, everyone will understand. So one of the things that we did is in the 80s and the 90s, there's a lot of apartment projects in the areas that we were looking at that were built with washer and dryer hookups. So in other words, they installed washer and dryer hookups so that residents could come in and they could bring their own washer and dryer sets in um, or not. And um, and then they also had laundry rooms. So very common design for a lot of properties. And so what we would do is we would buy a 200 unit building, let's say, and we would say, okay, so there's 200 sets of washer and dryer hookups. Let's buy 200 sets of washers and dryers for $100,000 because, you know, when you buy 200 of them, you can make, get them for about 500 a set. And um, let's put them in every single unit. And as the units turn, we'll, you know, we'll charge, you know, 35 to $65 per month more just for having a washer and dryer in their unit because what they're doing is they're walking down into the, into the laundry rooms anyway at, you know, a dollar fifty a load. So it's a good trade off. And so, uh, you know, never much pushback at all on that. And so that was one strategy we did early on. And, uh, you, you know, when you start to take a look at, let's say $50 a month times 200 times 12, you know, you start, it starts to add up. You know, so that's just one very simple strategy. The uh, the other thing that we've done is we've done wood floors. We've put in new appliances. You know, we've gone from the old almond kind to stainless. Um, sometimes we do granite ca- countertops. Sometimes we do new cabinets, all new hardware. Um, you know, we've done – we put in dog parks at all our projects. We put in – we've really blown out the clubhouses and put in really nice gyms. Um, you know, we're really into fitness and, and dogs. We, you know, as a company, we've embraced dogs nationally. And, um, you know, we think that, um, uh, you know, dogs, uh, pets are fine, actually, not just dogs, but pets. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things that we've done. And so, you know, instead of walking into something that's 25 years old, you know, an apartment that somebody's been lived in, you know, six or eight times, you, you know, you, you're basically renovating the whole inside. And, um, and so they're paying more money than they would on something, you know, that was, you know, maybe 25 years old. Such great information right there with the pet thing, because Fluffy and Fido right there is worth 150 to $200 to any pet owner uh, in extra rent per month just to be able to, to live in a place where they allow pets. We've identified the market. We've got boots on the ground, partners on the ground. We've identified the property. You guys have put the property on a, on a contract. There's a value add strategy to that. Um, and you have a property plan together. Now you get investors. How do you structure some of the deals? I know you offer a preferred return and equity to investors, which is fantastic and a huge differentiator. Can you share how you structure these private placements? Yeah, um, yeah, you bet. Yeah, and so, is there a preferred a, a return for a period of time before they restart to receive cash flow from the deal? Let me start with, um, I'll definitely answer that question, but let me let me tell you how we kind of think of it beforehand. So the way I look at every investor is that they have their money sitting somewhere already. It's in a bank, it's in a stock portfolio, a you know, mutual fund or 401k or whatever, you know, and um, – so typically, you know, you're taking it from something. So you have to assume that they're making money somewhere on something. Uh, it might not be very much. If it's in the bank, it certainly isn't. But uh, a lot of our investors are sophisticated, like a lot of your listeners. And so, you know, they're, everybody's trying to figure out, you know, where do I put my money right now? Do, you know, what do I trust and where do I think? So, so everybody has that mindset before they're coming to you. So. So what we do is we we do typically our typical deal is like a 7% preferred return. So let's say I'm raising 10 million bucks. So I know that I'm going to owe that that those people that give me the 10 million dollars 
seven hundred thousand a year. Does that make sense? Yeah, seven percent on ten million. So, so I need to make sure that my deal is cash flowing at least seven hundred thousand to cover that. So that's why I'm not a big proponent of flipping or you know buying something and and you know hoping it goes up or anything like that. That's why cash flow is so important to me because I'm looking. I want to cover. I want to pay my investors. You know, they're trusting me. And I want to make sure that whatever I have, cash flows. And so now, with that being said, sometimes I might find something that's completely broken, like a, a building that's, you know, 50% occupied or, you know, 60% occupied that's bank owned. Well, that is definitely not cash flowing. But if with a plan, I could probably get it there within, you know, a year to two years, depending on the size and the complexity. But the point is, is that I'm always cognizant of what I owe my investors every single year based on the money that I raise. And so, so we typically do like a 7% preferred return on, um, you know, on a, on a deal. It could be like a 50 50 deal where they get 50% of the project for putting up 100% of the money. But we want to make sure that we're covering that money. The most important piece of that, Michael, is that I don't actually get paid at all until I return that $10 million. That's a really important piece. So I'm behind that. So I'm not taking cash flow out of the properties while we own them, while their money's in front of mine, because the equity is in front of me. So a lot of the syndicators don't structure their deals this way, but we do. So we want to make sure that there's pressure. I want I want the pressure on me to return that capital because once I return that money, then I can you know, start to participate in the cash flow. And through the value add, I mean, by increasing the value and 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 the the operations uh, doing that more efficiently, um, you're raising the value of the property, and then you can refinance that also as part of the project plan and return the capital to the investors that way. That's exactly the whole strategy. Yeah. If there's no value add, I'm basically gambling, right? Buying something and, you know, crossing my fingers and hope it goes up. With a value add, I force equity. You know, I actually am investing, you know, to improve the property and increase the rents and, um, and, you know, try to get that net operating income up. And then I bring, like you said, I bring that back to the bank and um, hopefully that covers that 10 million. So that's the plan every time. How do I get the investor money back? You're listening to Ken McElroy on the Cashflow Ninja podcast. We will be right back after a word from our sponsor. Are you on track to achieve your financial goals? Income producing real estate is the most historically proven way to accumulate wealth and has created more financial freedom than any other means. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best turnkey cash flow rental properties. Our simple proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly income. Get your free strategy session with our knowledgeable investment counselors at noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. You're listening to Ken McElroy on the Cashflow Ninja podcast, and now back to our interview. Ken, what what do you look for for a stabilization? I know every property is different, but is there you kind of look at a project and say, you know, it's cash flowing already. We can increase this. You look at the lease terms, what kind of leases are on the property. Um, but what what generally are you looking for for a stabilization period of the property uh, in order to basically get that value add added, bump up the value of the property, and then start uh, negotiating with banks uh, for refinancing? Yeah, so another good question. So it, it, it depends on the size of the property and the complexity of the renovation. So, you know, um, like we do ground up construction. So I'll just walk you through that one because that's the riskiest. So we buy a piece of land. There's certainly no cash flow. It takes us 18 months to build something like a 300 unit prop apartment complex. So that's uh, basically, um, you know, you're now easily two years of with no cash flow. And then in year three, or say, let's say year, year, uh, year two to mid, mid year two, you're actually leasing the property in year three, you're maybe stabilizing and it could stabilize into year four. Only at that point 
and that, you, you know, in year four, are you really looking at being able to go back and, and negotiate with the banks? Cause the banks are not going to lend you anything unless your property is say in the, in the low 90% occupied. So, you know, so it could take four years on a new construction deal on something that's existing. You know, it could be, Something as simple as, uh, let's say, a 200-unit building that, you, you know, if we're doing interior renovations, you have to uh, assume that most of those units are occupied. So you're actually, now you're waiting for people to move out. So, you know, so you have to be patient and you have to, you have to be doing, you know, six to ten turnovers every single month. So, you know, that could take, that could take two years before you finally realize, you know, all the rent increases and all the things. Now you could do the clubhouse and the exterior paint and all that stuff right away, but you can't do all the interiors and that's really where all the money is. So, you know, that could take two years, but if it's a 300 unit building, it could, or 400 unit building, it take three years. So, you know, these are years out. Um, and then the risks are the, uh, the interest rate risk, you know, at that point and the market and what's going on with cap rates and all those kinds of things. So, you know, there's definitely risks in this business and, um, that's why we're not buying right now. You know, we're, we're on hold right now. We think the market's overcooked. Yeah. And that was actually my next question of, of where we are in the market cycle and what you guys are doing. So very, very interesting. The other question that I had too is, so the, the property is stabilized. You guys have refinanced it. Um, you've returned the money for the investors in a certain time frame you mentioned. And then the, the, the key here is the investors still maintain equity in the property with you. And, and now it becomes basically infinite returns. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, so don't forget that when you, when you go refinance anything, even your home, if you go refinance your home and do a cash out refi and do a remodel or buy a boat or whatever you want or a second house or, you know, that money is not taxable because you don't pay tax on debt because you owe it back. So it's not, uh, you know, when you, when we're going and getting debt, um, for a refinance, we're distributing it to all our investors and hopefully a hundred percent of their equity back, but not in all cases, you know, that's certainly the goal though. And, you know, if we can return that capital, it's a cash out refi, it's tax free. All that money they just got back is tax free. So there's been many cases uh, in our company where, you know, people have given us some millions of dollars and we've given it back three or four years later, hundred percent of it tax free. And, um, and so, you, you know, at that point it is infinite because there's no investment. The biggest thing about that, Michael, is that we're out from behind that preferred return the you know, that 7%. Cause if I got, if I have 5 million of investor equity, you know, I owe $350,000 a year first. And so once you return the capital, you don't owe the preferred return anymore. It's no longer a cost of the deal. So, so now the greatest thing is, is that that cash flow just basically pours down, you know, and that's when I participate and the investors stay in, you know, we always keep all the investors in um, because we feel like they got us to where they, um, you know, they got us to that point. And even though we return all their equity, they should participate, uh, you know, moving forward with us. Now, Ken, you've shared some fantastic insights around partnerships and at what time you need to establish a partnership, uh, not to jump the, bu- the gun, if you will. Um, can you share a little bit about uh, this advice with my listeners? On, on which piece, Michael? On the- uh, just on when you should start a partnership and when it's beneficial, because I think a lot of people think that that's something that they should be, do immediately. Because it's not, you know, it's not necessarily the right time if there's no deal on the table. I completely agree with you. I, I don't think that, first of all, partnerships are hard. And mine is incredibly good with my partner, Ross McAllister. But I, there's more partner disputes that I see out there than anything. Because, you know, when, you, you know, it only, it only becomes a dispute when, you know, there's, there's serious money coming in. So, I think the, the right way to do a deal is to put together is have everybody have their own businesses and put a deal together with some agreed upon splits. 
you know, so, you know, in a traditional partnership of two, it'd be 50, 50, but you don't actually have to have a company together. You could actually have two entities, you know, and just do one deal together. If uh, that's probably the best way to do it. Cause at the end of that deal, you might not like each other. You might really like each other, but um, these days with entities, the way you know everybody can have their own entity, you know, people can all come together and um, and do a deal together. You don't necessarily have to have a company unless you're trying to build a big brand like we have now, you, you know, and what we've done. But that it's not really needed anymore. You can the, the nice part about these kind of deals is that you can be like a speedboat. You know, you can move around from deal to deal and do it with different partners and different markets. Markets and you know, and everybody brings different things. So that's um, that's a great way to go into partnership because you mitigate any issues beyond one you know beyond one deal. But if you want to do something, you know, there's no reason honestly to put together a company and and um, and to go out and brand. You know, there's just in my opinion. Right. And, and Ken, you've spoken about the, the power of, of mentorship and the role that it's played for you. And, you know, there might be listeners listening to this right now and saying, well, boy, you know, I'm not Ken McElroy, but Ken McElroy didn't come from anything and also started somewhere. What advice can you give uh, to them with starting and uh, w- what can you share around the concept of uh, mentorship? Yeah. Well, here's what I found. Like, I've never paid for a mentorship or a coach. So I, I actually have, I have a, I have a coach, um, for, you know, working out. I have, I had a coach, um, you know, I, I ended up climbing Kilimanjaro about a little over a year ago. I have a coach for that. I have a, I have a, I have somebody help me write my books. I have a coach for that. I have a coach for, you know, uh, my family and my personal stuff. And so I'm a huge fan of coaches and I just think that there's a lot of really talented people out there everywhere that know a lot more than me and a lot of things. And, you know, just even the one, like when I was trying to raise my family and my kids are teenagers now, um, so they're not completely out of the house yet. Well, one is, but the point is, is that I went to a guy who had five kids and, you know, all those kids were coming back to him you know, uh, for summers and he had this incredible relationship with his wife and his kids. And so I'm like, I want, I want that guy. So I met with him uh, a couple times a month for 10 years and for free, I just bought him lunch. And so, you know, it's, it's not that hard to find really successful people that are, and I've, I've done it to a bunch of young men and women in, you know, in this town where they come on and say, Hey, can I shadow you here? Or shadow you there? We've given internships, those kinds of things. Um, and you know, it's all part of it. And so, you know, it's essentially just find the expert or find somebody you admire that's doing really, really well in an area of their life. And it could be a real estate person. It could be a mortgage person. It, you know, it could be a property manager. And, and, you know, just, uh, just ask them if you can hang out with them and ask them questions. That's the best way, I think, to get educated. Okay, and you've, you wrote The Sleeping Giant, The Awakening of the Self-Employed Entrepreneur. And, I mean, by teaching your children a skill of entrepreneurship, you'll really equip them uh, to be a pro- producer in society, providing value for others and value to the world and uh, not only help them uh, – reach their own dreams, but also helping others. Now, I really love what you put out about entrepreneurship and the power of that and teaching your children on entrepreneurship. What, and what, what are some of the ways that you taught your children entrepreneurship? Yeah, it actually started pretty easily. I, you know, obviously they had a huge benefit because they've been around Kiyosaki like, you know, hundreds of times and, you know, and he's, um, he's a hardcore entrepreneur, but and I, you know, I'm, I'm in a group called uh, YPO and entrepreneurs organization as well. And so they, they've been to a bunch of retreats and things with me, you know, and so, you know, we're pounding away on, you know, financial freedom and, and um, you know, just freedom for yourself on, on a number of levels for years and years and years and years. So, so we, we actually started really simply with just the golf balls. You know, I, I own a home in Idaho and, uh, you know, we live on a golf course and the kids would go out at night. I'd bring them out on the golf court and course and they would, they would, um, you know, they'd get like 50 balls a night and, 
you know, sell them back to all kinds of people, you know, uh, and you know, they, you know, they got, and that's actually, that was the best, one of the best, that was three summers. And that was one of the best teaching lessons because there were a million things. There were other kids that want to cut in. So there were partnership issues. There were brand issues where they were, you know, trying to figure out, you know, why some were selling and others weren't. There were packaging issues on like if, if they were clean or not clean, you know, they would run into the pro shop and see what they're selling for. Even when we go to town to a sporting goods store, they'd run over to the section to see what they were selling for so that, you know, they could undercut the competition and they were marketing them. They were selling them. They had, you know, they, they, by the end of the third, by the end of the second year and going into the third year, they literally knew, they knew what people's, you know, I mean, cause uh, it was a country club, like John Elway plays with a title of seven, right? Cause that was his number. So, you know, they would go up, he doesn't hit very many balls in, in, in the drink. So, but they, you know, they knew those were his. And so, you know, he, they would go and, you know, package these things up and they knew who to bring them to. They'd say, you know, they knew who like Taylor Mays, who like Titleist, who like Callaway. And, um, you know, so they would, they would, they were raking it in. They would get make thousands of dollars every summer and uh, they loved it. And so, then I made them take part of that. I take, I, I made them take half their money and stick it in a jar and then decide what the next business would be. And then that turned into, um, they started making duct tape wallets. And then from that business turned into an online music business. And then that next business turned into that, you know, they started doing, um, self, uh, Apple, Apple, uh, cell phone covers, repairs and, you know, for 75 bucks each. And so, you know, basically but you know that's so so that's how we rolled it out and we we did all these different things like barter trying to teach them how to barter try to you know try to teach them how to how to have something and trade up and you know if if, if your listeners haven't ever watched on youtube the red paper clip i highly recommend it it's a phenomenal video uh it's a true uh story and it's called the red paper clip and basically the guy starts with the red paper clip and he ends with a house and it's all through barter, no money exchange at all. And um, so we, we watch that video and we start to do any, all these things about just being creative. But I will tell you the best thing that happened of all things from all of this, that my kids never asked me for money because they always knew how to make it. And all the other kids all the time were like, how is it that you always have money? And my kids' response were, it's really not that hard to make money, you, you know. And so – the kids were always asking my kids, you know, how do you, how, you know, how do you make money? Even, even, uh, as, as recent as a couple of weeks ago, my son w- found this knife on the internet, you know, he's into knives right now. So he bought three, um, he actually bought through, actually bought four, but sold the three for the price of the four and got one free. So he syndicated a knife for himself and sold the other three to his buddies. He already had them sold before he bought them. So he went and found, you know, what he wanted and found three other guys to get them charge them 10 bucks more and end up with a free knife. So those are the kinds of things that are so simple that kids can do. And, you know, it's empowering for them. You know, they're, they're literally complete. They have their own money. They're empowered. They don't have to ask me, you know, for, for much. And um, that's, that's really, really, really builds their confidence. No, that's amazing. And again, one habit I've observed from wealthy and successful people is that they're always studying new subjects and learning new skill sets. What are you currently studying and what new skill sets are you currently learning? Well, I'm, I'm continually reading a ton of books. So, you know, I would say in my 30s, I was reading a lot of business type books. But then in my 40s, I started really getting a little more spiritual, not necessarily religious books, but spiritual. So the the books that um, – the business books that I just finished was Road to Ruin by James Rickard, a phenomenal book about currency markets and the stock market and, you know, and, and basically the money wars between countries. Um, that is a phenomenal book. But on the spiritual side, I just finished Untethered Soul and Awakening and – um we actually did a book study on it, Untethered Soul with Kiyosaki, with all the advisors. And, you know, that's just about basically your inner voice. Like, you know, that's actually more personal development stuff. But I, I really think you need that stuff. Uh, you know, trying to, you know, everybody, what happens is I think you got this little voice that keeps you small um, and or, you know, maybe there was some trauma or some shock in your life for whatever reason. Um, maybe you didn't grow up with any parents or maybe you grew up with abusive parents. 
or, you know, maybe you grew up with, you know, in a cult or whatever it is. I mean, you have to unwind that stuff. And, um, you know, as we say, sometimes, you know, you have to unlearn and then relearn. And I think that can be really hard. And so, so I spent a lot of time on just looking at everybody's viewpoint as, as it stands. So I try not to take a hard stance on much if I can, even though I do have my opinions, I'm always trying to change my own. And I don't think a lot of people move through life that way. I think they move through life with their own opinion. And, um, you know, I'm always looking to for somebody else's because it's, it could be, you know, m- m- way bigger than mine. And so that's essentially what Awakening and uh, the Untethered Soul books are. And then I just got back last, last week. I spent a full week immersed with Robert and the Rich Dad Advisors at a Texas ranch working on just pure personal development, this kind of stuff, um, you know, because it really does go hand in hand. I mean, some people think it's hokey and all that, but I'm telling you that once you become more aware and once you become more accepting and you have a little more empathy and, and all those things, the karma starts rolling in. Um, not, and I was never trying for that, but, you know, our company's gotten stronger, bigger, better, more profitable. And uh, we just won a bunch of huge awards, ninth best country, nice, ninth best multifamily co- uh, company in the nation. And, um, y- you know, of course, we won all the Arizona awards because uh, we're local for, you know, uh, businesses in the 250 to 500 category. But, y- you know, all those things have to do with it's top down. So, you know, the way you deal with people, your character, you know, you, you know, your word, your loyalty, your trust and all those kinds of things, they resonate through the whole organization. And so I work a lot on myself individually in addition to the business stuff, which I'm all over. I go to all the seminars on the business stuff. I read everything I can and listen to podcasts just like you do. But, you know, it has to be both. No, fantastic. And congratulations on all of those awards. And I couldn't agree with you more. You know, it's, it's kind of funny that out there <laughs> in society and a lot in the media, I mean, the word skeptic has such a bad connotation right now. And it's, you know, to your, to your point, you know, I'm skeptic of my own opinions. I constantly ask too, have I got this right? Uh, is there another way to look at it? You know, you, as Robert Kiyosaki would also say that, you know, always say there's three sides of a coin, right? You know, it's uh, 100% the- true, Michael. Yeah. yeah, it's the biggest gift you can give yourself the, is openness. I'm not kidding. Like, like, even if you don't believe the person or you don't want to believe the person, you should try to look at their point of view. Right, right. Now, and everybody's got a different perspective and a background and life experiences. And, and that's been uh, the fascinating part of my life personally, too, traveling a little bit and being from South Africa, bring, you know, looking at, at it from, from that way, too. Um, but, Ken, you know, a core message in our show is to leave our families, communities, and the world better than we found it by passing down a mindset, values, and principles to future generations, not just money. So if you cannot pass on any money to future generations and we're only allowed to pass on three principles to them to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? Sure. That's a great question. Well, I think... Uh, the first one for me is education. In other words, you know, if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, I feel like my kids are set up. They're start. They're on their road to understanding, you know, a lot of things. And so I think a lot of, I did this when I got out of school, I stopped reading books. I start, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm in corporate America now. And then I hit a plateau. So I think education, but the, you know, education is, you know, doesn't just mean, you know, how does money work and how do I make it? Right. Um, you know, that's a, that's a big one. The, um, the other piece that I, I, I strongly believe is I actually think that I think everybody has happiness in them. So when they're kids, you mean, you know, if you look at a five-year-old kid, they have, they have no adult influence on them you know, and, and they're as happy as can be. They'll walk up to anybody. They'll do anything, you know, they're chatty. They, you know, they go to a playground and they like, okay, who's going to be my friend today. Right. So, you know, everything after that, for whatever reason, um, kind of dumbs down the happiness piece. And so, so I think happiness is in everybody. And I, I actually believe that you actually need to lose things. You have to, you actually have to get rid of things and, you know, in order to be happy. 
That's, that's my belief. You know, I don't, I don't think you can get it. I don't think you can, I don't think you can get it from, you know, you can be temporarily happy by something somebody says, um, you could be temporarily happy from, you know, buying a new Ferrari, but you know, that stuff is all crap. It's all just material stuff, you know? And, um, you, you know, but you, you know, no, no, no relationship can make you happy either. And you can't change anybody else. So, you know, those are, those are my beliefs. I think that, um, that piece. And then I, uh, the last piece, you know, that, that I've, uh, I've learned over time is that if you just focus on yourself and that's it, you don't worry about anybody else. You, you'll have, you'll just soar right by everybody. And I think what happens is it's easy to look out and point a finger and say, Hey, you know, if that person did this, things would be better. Or, you know, if he or she did this or, you know, or whatever. And, you know, they, they create their own drama by, by, you know, trying to correct and adjust and control, you know, everybody else when really, honestly, the only thing that they really have control over is themselves. That's it. And so if, if the, if, you know, if your listeners can focus on themselves in, I'm talking about it in every single way. For me, it's physically, it's spiritually, it's financially, you know, and, and, and make sure that, you know, you're working on all those different things all the time, you, you know, that, um, you know, you'll be, you'll be successful, you know, and whatever success means to people is different, you know, and, you know, to my, uh, to my wife, it's not money at all. Right. And to my kids, you know, it is right now, but it might not be later to me, actually success isn't money, you know, it's family. So, you know, it's, everybody's got their different thing. And, um, but there's, there's nothing anybody can do outside of themselves. I, I'm a firm believer of that. No, I couldn't agree with you more. I have a similar, similar view on that. And, you know, that wealth and, and happiness truly is, is what's left when you, as you said, you do, don't have any possessions left or a lot. There's no money left too, right? A lot of folks, I think, uh, including myself, when things when when things have been lost, then you realize what what is wealth and what is happiness and who you are. Uh, the awareness of self, as as you alluded to, um, Ken. How can my listeners learn more about you, your company, and and stay informed of all of the projects that you're involved with? Sure. Yeah. So our company is MC Companies. www.mccompanies, which is m c c o m p a n i e s dot com. Um, you can also find me at uh, kenmcelroy.com, so K-E-N-M-C-E-L-R-O-Y.com. So, yeah, either one, uh, you know, and you can – all kinds of ways to take a look and see what we're doing and, you know, weigh in on some of the things we're doing. It's all tra- very transparent. And you have fantastic educational resources. Besides your books, I would highly recommend Kenflix. You really share a lot of great content. And things that we uh, discussed in this interview, you get a little bit more into depth. The, the, the videos are short and nicely presented, so I would highly recommend to watch that too. Ken, you're an extremely uh, generous person. Giving is a very big part of what you do. You support a ton of charities, and a lot of the, the proceeds from your book go, go back to charities. Thank you so much for being so generous with uh, your most important asset, your time today with me. Uh, this has been an honor having you on the show, and thank you for sharing your journey with my listeners and providing so much value for them. Of course, Michael. Good luck to you, man. Thank you for having me on. This is MC Laubscher, the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast. As you may know, I'm also the president and chief wealth strategist of Valhalla Wealth Financial. We help individuals, families, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and professionals build their wealth outside of Wall Street and help investors maximize the use of every dollar in their personal economy and boost their investment gains. We do this by combining the capital and investments with the financial vehicle of the wealthy according to the infinite banking concept. If you're interested to learn more about privatized banking and the infinite banking concept, you can access an exclusive webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash be the bank. Thank you for joining myself and my guest Ken McElroy on the Cashflow Ninja today. If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here at the Cashflow Ninja, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes and share our show with family, friends, and your network.
I'm always trying to learn and improve in every area of my life. So if there's any way that I can provide more value to you and serve you better, please reach out to me at info at cashflowninja.com. If you're not a subscriber to the Cashflow Ninja Gushku newsletter, you can sign up for our newsletter at cashflowninja.com or text Cashflow Ninja to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. You can also support the show by becoming a patron on Patreon for $10 a month. When you become a patron for 12 months, you get access to our private Facebook page and a Cashflow Ninja t-shirt. Jimmy Freeland and Bob Scott have been in your shoes and have used real estate investing to become financially free. They've designed a system to take any beginner to an experienced deal-making investor in the least amount of time. They offer opportunities from basic education, coaching, bridge loan investing to turnkey investments in the cash-flowing market of St. Louis, Missouri. For more information, please visit joinupsproperties.com or call Jimmy and Bob at 314-799-2247. If you're not earning at least 8% on your cash, you do not want to miss the private lending presentation for non-accredited investors done by Jimmy Freeland and Bob Scott. Discover how to create an income stream from real estate without the management headaches. You can access the presentation at cashflowninja.com forward slash private lending. Creating passive income for you and your family is easier than you think. All you need are three things. The right plan, the right product, and the right turnkey provider. As an investor, you want a safe, profitable, and convenient way to invest your capital without being at the mercy of stock market fluctuation. Investing in real estate in a turnkey way that provides monthly passive income with very low risk is exactly what Spartan Invest provides for their clients. Their mission is to make investing in real estate easy for the busy professional. Spartan Invest help investors create passive income and wealth through turnkey ownership in Birmingham, Alabama. You can download your free report, Five Big Reasons to Invest in the Magical City of Birmingham, Alabama at CashflowNinja.com forward slash Spartan. The wealthiest families on the planet know how to capture their wealth and then leveraging their wealth through their own banking system. If you're interested in privatized banking and the infinite banking concept and learning the premier strategies of the wealthiest individuals and families on the planet, you can access your free webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash be the bank. That's our show for today, everyone. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. You have been listening to the Cash Flow Ninja with your host, MC Laubscher, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Today's show notes and resources are available on our website, CashflowNinja.com. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objective, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.